Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was very kind of you to invite me here. And um, I, as a preface, uh, I met with Dean Gupta, and he asked me uh, not just to talk about male circumcision, uh, but to give a general background about the HIV epidemic, particularly as it affects Africa, and what we can do to control this epidemic. So um, HIV, this is a global map, and these are the WHO estimates of the number of people, 33 0.4 million people uh, infected with HIV around the world today. And you can see the majority of those pa patients are in Africa, particularly in Eastern and Southern Africa. And this uh, shows the increase in the number of people living with HIV over time, uh, up to our current estimate of 33 million. And then um, here we have the deaths and new infections. Um, deaths have flattened out because since about 2004, we have had antiretrovirals available, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, HIV is an exceptional disease. And it's exceptional because it is almost uniformly fatal. There's no other disease like that. I mean, Ebola has an 80% mortality rate, but it just flares up and dies out. This is an extraordinarily pernicious disease where the virus um, has, takes about seven to 10 years to cause disease, during which time people are infectious to their, particularly their sexual partners. So, HIV has um, demanded an enormous amount of effort. This is, a, again, uh, the map of Africa showing you, by the intensity of color, the level, the prevalence, the proportion of the adult populations infected. And as you go down eastern to particularly the southern cone, you get extraordinarily high rates of adult infections. You've got to bear in mind a uniformly fatal disease. This is the estimated <coughs> impact of HIV on the expectation of life in the countries most severely affected. So um, for many years, we were making real inroads with improved life expectancy uh, in many sub-Saharan African countries. That, those gains plummeted with the onset of this epidemic. Botswana is one of the most severely affected countries. And this is an estimate of what the population structure of Botswana would be if we didn't have treatment for this disease. The light bars uh, represent the population by age if there had not been HIV and the dark blue is what the population structure will be uh, uh, in uh, 2020 if we didn't have treatment for this disease. A devastating impact, I mean, from a business perspective, you know, huge loss of the working age populations. So um, the advent of highly active antiretroviral therapy has revolutionized the prognosis of this disease. It, this combination drug therapy was developed in the mid-90s. And since um, the, particularly 2004, whoops, um, under PEPFAR, that's the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, and the Global Fund, we've had a big expansion of heart therapy um, in sub-Saharan Africa. So this shows um, the, uh, the, the uh, heart use um, and the big red bar is the increase in heart uh, in Africa. Um, 
This has been one of the most extraordinary uh, therapeutic programs uh, in the history of medicine because this is a chronic disease. Treatment is going to have to be maintained for life. Um, there is no cure. But a key point is we cannot treat our way out of this epidemic. We can only provide humanitarian therapy to a minority of people affected by this disease. But that treatment is not going to control the epidemic. And this is the increase in expectation of life um, with H heart treatment. Uh, and uh, sorry, these are the number of people. Um, in the developed world, we've seen enormous uh, improvements. In Africa, it's still quite modest. We are not yet able to treat all the people who need therapy in the continent. So I want to move from this general background to say what has been successful and what has not in the control of this epidemic. One of the earliest successes medically was the control of mother to child HIV transmission, either when the baby is in utero, at time of delivery, or through breast milk. And I'll say a bit more about it in a moment. Another approach has been pre, what is called pre-exposure prophylaxis. This is giving antiretroviral drugs to HIV uninfected people uh, so that when they're exposed to the virus, those drugs will prevent infection. And there have been two uh, trials that were just um, published this year, um, both showing remarkable efficacy, and I'll describe that in a moment. I'll say a little more about uh, antiretroviral treatment and very little about condoms. Most of what I'm going to talk about will be male circumcision. Um, but what has not been effective, I think, is even more instructive. The control, we initially thought that the epidemic in Africa was so severe because sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, were acting as cofactors enhancing the transmission of HIV. And there's no question that sexually transmitted diseases do increase infectivity of an infected person or vulnerability of an uninfected person. However, virtually all the trials of control of STDs for HIV prevention have been negative. However, it is still being promoted despite the medical evidence of lack of efficacy. Um, there were a lot of efforts to produce microbicides. These are compounds that particularly women can use um, to prevent infection and it has been an urgent need to find methods that women can use to protect themselves. Sadly, all the trials of inert microbicides, those without drugs, were negative. HIV vaccines, um, there have been several um, trials, only one showed modest efficacy and it is highly questioned. I, I can go into the details later. But the vaccine has been, at this point in time, uh, a very disappointing effort despite huge investment. Um, and then behavioral change. Clearly, um, be human behavior is critical to the transmission of this infection, whether it be sexual, drug use, etc. The problem we have is we don't know how to change human behavior. Now, there have been examples of behavioral change um, that have reduced the likelihood of infection, but we don't know how to bring them about. So let's talk first about mother-to-child transmission. To give you an idea of the magnitude of the problem, this is the percent of pregnant women 
who are HIV infected in these different African countries. All of these women would transmit to their babies in about 30% of cases in the absence of treatment. And those babies, unfortunately, would die very rapidly. The, the median expectation of a life of an HIV-infected infant is two years. So there were a number, so in the absence of treatment, about 30% of the babies become infected. Then um, there are two drugs, AZT, or Zidovidine, and NVP, Nevirapine, um, that were shown to be effective in the uh, 90s. And um, they, the therapy was improved. And you can see these huge drops in transmission to mother to child. And today, um, if you treat women with heart during pregnancy, you can get infection down to about 1%. Um, that's what we see in the United States. And that's what we have actually been able to achieve in Uganda um, in this program that uh, we run. But that, our, our experience is only a minority of the experience throughout Africa. Trans the coverage of pregnant women with testing and with this prophylactic treatment um, is unfortunately very incomplete in most countries. Uh, so this is the estimate of the number of infant infections that have been averted by the availability of the drugs for pregnant mums. And the, it is a big success story. There's a huge number of babies that uh, have been saved as a consequence of this therapy. This is one of the more recent trials um, of a microbicide, it was a vaginal gel containing a drug called tenofovir, and it was women were supposed to take it before and after sexual intercourse. And um, this was the rate of infection in women in the, um, who were randomized to the tenofovir treatment compared to as 5.6% compared to 9% in the placebo comparison. So they saw about a 39% lower HIV rate in the women on tenofovir. It was imperfect, largely because compliance with these treatments is not perfect. Nevertheless, this is a breakthrough. Um, then, uh, later this uh, year, uh, the, a trial was published. It would involve uh, men who have sex with men. And the drugs that they were using were tenofovir with another uh, almost unpronounceable drug, uh, imtricibine. It's FTC. It's much easier. Um, in the men who were randomized to the drug combination, the HIV rate was 2.9% in the men in the placebo, 4.8%, so it's 44% lower. And there are a whole slew of other trials in progress that are looking at different combinations of drugs, either, um, and in this case, the men took the drugs every day. It was not related to intercourse. Others are related to intercourse. Um, but this fills us with hope that there is now um, medication, particularly that, that can be used by women, uh, that can prevent this infection. But um, condom use, you think, is a no-brainer. We know condoms prevent sexually transmitted infection. And we have good evidence that it can prevent HIV. The problem <laughs> is it's very hard to persuade people to consistently use condoms. Um, and so condom use can be highly efficacious, but lack of consistency in use is quite problematic. Antiretroviral therapy could reduce transmission, and we have now shown this in, the in a number of studies, um, and that 
the antiretrovirals reduce transmission because they drop the viral load in the blood and the genital secretions of the infected person. The problem is that you only start treating HIV-infected people late in the disease um, when they're starting to become immune compromised. So for many years, uh, these people are not receiving the drugs. And to start treating very early in infection is problematic because at that stage the person doesn't feel sick but you're giving them drugs that often have side effects and so you're taking a, a person who either, uh, otherwise feels well and giving medications that make them feel lousy and guess what, they don't take them regularly. Uh, it's been argued that we could use treatment to control the epidemic but in sub-Saharan Africa, I personally think this is an impossibility. Uh, we, can ha we cannot treat people now who are dying of this infection, even though we have the drugs, because the problem is overwhelming. So I want to now talk about male circumcision. And um, a student gave me this little image. And I thought, that's rather nice, the fruits of our labor. Um, Circumcision is an interesting issue. I, I never really gave it much thought until I got involved in these studies. It, it is the oldest form of elective surgery, and you can find evidence in Paleolithic times of circumcised penises. Now, these are sculptures. They're <laughs> not fossils. But, um, but, you know, obviously it was adopted by the Egyptians, adopted by Judaism, and um, by Islam. You might wonder why on earth were people circum being circumcised back so many centuries ago? And I don't have an answer, other than there's a very interesting experience in the Second World War when the Americans were in North Africa. And um, they found that there was a, something like 140,000 troops uncircumcised, living in the desert with no water, suffering terrible infections and irritation from sand that required circumcision or other forms of therapy. In other words, having a foreskin in a dry desert climate is a real disadvantage. So uh, I think that that is why you had um, circumcision adopted in the uh, Middle Eastern civilizations and then diffused through particularly Islam and Judaism around the world. So I want to move on to now say something about male circumcision as a method for HIV prevention um, and particularly describe some of the studies that we have done with our colleagues in Uganda. First of all, we had evidence going back to the late 1980s uh, that I found very persuasive that male circumcision reduced the risk of HIV in men. But that evidence was not enough to really persuade the policymakers. We had to do randomized trials because those are the gold standard for evidence in medicine. And the reason we had to do that is that men are not usually circumcised at random. They're either, say in our case in Uganda, they were Muslim men. And Muslim men had cultural characteristics that could place them at lower risk of HIV. So we couldn't differentiate between the culture causing circumcision and the biologic effects of circumcision. So we had to do trials, and there were three trials done in South Africa, Kenya, and Uganda. And they all have a somewhat similar structure. We all enrolled HIV-negative uncircumcised men. We randomized them then to either get circumcision immediately or circumcision delayed for approximately two years. And then we looked at HIV incidence, that's new HIV infections, safety, behavior, and sexually transmitted infections. And this is um, a way of depicting the results of these trials. Um, this is what is called a forest plot. 
So if something is having no effect, it will fall on this line with a 1. If something is protective, it will be less than 1. This is the summary of all the observational studies before the trials, and these are the summaries of the trials. And this is all the data put together. Essentially, these reductions in risk are almost identical. And the overall conclusion of this is there's about circumcision reduces HIV acquisition in men by about 58%. Now, we've never actually seen anything like this in other fields. We've never seen observational data agreeing with three trials and each of those trials agreeing with one another. It's about, it's a, as close to a slam dunk as you can get in this kind of research. And this led The Lancet to say that um, there are three randomized trials. They now prove, uh, provide firm evidence um, that the risk of HIV is reduced by male circumcision. So why is circumcision protective? Um, there are various reasons. First of all, the fo this depicts the foreskin. So the area under the intact foreskin is warm, it's moist, it's a great place for bugs to grow, and I'll give you some examples of that. Um, in addition, the inner layer of the foreskin is um, very light, what is known as lightly keratinized. Keratin is a protein you've got on your skin. Um, it is virtually absent from the inner surface of the foreskin. And that makes it, the inner surface, very vulnerable to HIV. Um, also, during intercourse, that foreskin is drawn back over the penis, so the vulnerable inner surface is exposed to vaginal secretions. The other thing is that the foreskin contains all the target cells that HIV needs. There are these um, what are called dendritic cells, which are in the superficial or epidermis of the foreskin. Uh, those are the first cells that the virus penetrates. Then it, those, those cells will present the virus to these two other kinds of immune cells, CD4 and CD8 T cells, and those CD8s, uh, CD4s and CD8s disseminate the virus around the body. So the foreskin's got everything that the virus needs. The foreskin is also vulnerable to inflammation, and, and these are all these inflammatory cells. Those inflammatory cells are the target cells. They're the CD4s and CD8s. Um, and there's a, uh, particularly in poor hygienic circumstances, you find a lot of inflammation um, in the foreskin. And then these are some studies that um, we did in Uganda. Um, after we circumcised men, we measured the size of their foreskin, and we looked backwards in time to determine their rates of prior HIV infection. And this is the size of the foreskin, and this is their rate of HIV infection. So the rate of infection increases with the size of the foreskin. And you can then convert that into the number of target cells in the bigger foreskin. So um, the uh, subtitle of the paper was Size Matters, <laughs> um, but not in the way that most men think of it. Small is Beautiful was the title I was going to give it, and I got vetoed. <laughs> OK, so we did these trials. We had our explanation as to why the surgery might have worked. The next question was, um, what is the effectiveness of this procedure outside of a randomized trial context? And so there were two studies that have looked at this in Kenya and in Uganda. These are the data from our studies in Uganda. So this is the period of the trial. And this is the rate of new infections in men who were circumcised during the trial and men who remained uncircumcised. Then after the trial, 
these men who were controls were provided with circumcision and their rate of infection dropped, whereas those who, men who were in the controls who declined in uh, circumcision had very high rates or persistent high rates of HIV infection. So effectiveness lasts um, uh, beyond the trial. The next question was, what are the effects on risk behavior? There's a concern uh, that we might see a phenomenon known as uh, risk compensation. Now, this is seen in many areas of public health. When they introduce seat belts, people drive faster, is one classic example. So the concern was that if men think that they're protected by circumcision, they're going to take, they can indulge in more risky sex. This was not seen during the trials in Kenya and Uganda. It was seen in the South African trial. But the trials are rather unusual circumstances because there's very intensive health education. So these guys were brainwashed during that trial. Um, these are data from uh, our studies in Uganda looking at sexual behavior at the, last, at the end of the trial versus sexual behavior after the trial if a man was circumcised or he was not circumcised. And the men who remained uncircumcised took that decision as deliberate choice. And essentially we saw no difference in sexual risk behavior, which was a relief because we were concerned that men would let their hair down, so to speak. Okay, I want to move on from there because uh, our primary objective in these trials was to look at sexually transmitted infections, but we have looked at a variety of other, sorry, our primary objective was HIV, but we've looked at a series of other infections. So this is um, herpes or HSV2, um, and circumcision reduced herpes by 27%, new infections. Uh, it didn't have any impact on syphilis. Syphilis was about 2.4, 2.1% in both the circumcised and control arm. However, circumcision reduced genital ulcer disease. GUD is genital <coughs> ulcer disease. And we saw that both for men who reported a history of genital ulcers over the prior six months or men who had ulcers at the time that we saw them, and the reduction was similar between 46 to 54 percent. Now this is important because ulceration is, uh, provides a portal of entry for the virus. So reducing ulcers should be beneficial. So the next question we asked was, can we disaggregate the contributions of removing the target cells by removing the foreskin from the effects on genital ulcer disease or herpes type 2. And what we found was when we did all our calculations, about 80% of the protection against HIV afforded by circumcision came from removing those target cells. Um, we've gone on to look at other infections. And a very important one is human papillomavirus, or uh, HR, uh, and the high-risk form, which is called HR, HPV. Um, these viruses cause cervical, penile, penile, and anal cancers. And in East Africa, and Uganda in particular, we have some of the highest rates of particularly cervical cancer in the world. So we looked at both male and female HPV in relation to circumcision. And the South African trial also looked at male um, HPV infection. And essentially what both the South African trial and our own work in Uganda showed was about a 34 to 35% reduction in male HPV infection if the man was circumcised. And we looked at individual types of viruses. These are all the cancer-inducing viruses. And for each individual virus, we saw circumcision was protective.
We've also looked at uh, other bugs in the um, penis. And what we, um, what we did was take a swab from the man before and after he was circumcised and did the same thing um, among the controls. And what we were focusing on were certain pro-inflammatory, what are known as anaerobic bacteria. These bacteria that live in the absence of oxygen. And what we found is that these anaerobes um, decreased markedly pre-circumcision. There are about 33, a third of all bugs were the, um, this particular clostridial anaerobe dropped to about 3.6% after circumcision. And the same with this other uh, family of anaerobes. Um, so the reason these bugs are important is that they're highly inflammatory. And anything that causes inflammation provides a target for HIV. So this is a bit like um, the old adage that sunshine is the um, best disinfectant. In this case, it's oxygen is the best disinfectant. Um, We've looked at the other issues like uh, sexual satisfaction and dysfunction, and we found no adverse effects of circumcision um, among men. They almost 98 to 99% said that um, they had no change in sexual satisfaction. I now want to switch gears and look at circumcision's effects on female partners. And why did we want to do a trial in women? Um, well, the main p reason was we had some evidence that female partners of circumcised men may be protected against HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. The only way we could prove that was doing a trial in which we enrolled HIV-infected men and determined whether uh, circumcision might reduce transmission to the female partner. The other reason we were interested in doing this is that if we have circumcision programs, we couldn't exclude HIV-positive men from them because that would be highly stigmatizing. So this is the main outcome of the trial, where the men were HIV-infected, their wives uninfected, half the men were circumcised, half were not. And sadly, what we found was that the rate of HIV acquisition was higher in the wives, the intervention arm men, the circumcised men, the control men. And I can't tell you what a heartbreak it was to see that result. And we tried to figure out why uh, this was so contrary to our expectations. And one of the things we looked at was, when did couples resume sex after circumcision? So these were men who were circumcised, and they resumed sex before their wound was completely healed. These were men who were circumcised, but they delayed sex. And these were the control uncircumcised. And this is the rate of HIV infection six months after they enrolled in the studies. So the very high rates of HIV infection occurred in the minority of couples who started sex early. In those couples who, who, where the man was circumcised but sex was delayed, there was no difference with the controls. Um, the, so the, the message from this is that um, we have to persuade people to delay intercourse after surgery for the minimum of four to six weeks. We've looked at a variety of other infections um, in female partners, circumcised men, and we find reductions in trichomonas and this condition BV or bacterial vaginosis. This is an important condition um, if the mum becomes pregnant it can influence the pregnancy outcome very adversely. So those were all beneficial effects. I want to move on now to talk about HPV 
uh, because this is an important virus, it's a cause of cervical cancer. And um, in the intervention women in blue, we saw a substantial reduction in the cancer causing HPV PV viruses over two years compared to women married to uncircumcised men. We do have HPV vaccines. And those vaccines contain, uh, protect women against two of the cancer-producing viruses. The, they have limited efficacy against other of the 14 cancer-producing viruses. They cost a bomb. They require, probably will require boosters, and they have to be given to women before they have been exposed to the HPV virus. So they have to be given to very young adolescents. We don't think we're going to have these vaccines in Africa. So circumcision may provide some protection for women in the African context. It's a one-time procedure, um, it's cheap, and uh, we can argue that this is a, uh, a, a peripheral, uh, it, this is a potential benefit to women, even if we did not demonstrate protection against HIV. Um, one of the more enjoyable outcomes of all of this was asking the w women who had had relations with a man before he, and after he was circumcised and asking them um, what was better. And almost 40% of um, the wives said they preferred relations after circumcision than before. Um, about 57% said no change and about 3% said they were less happy. And the main reason there was this improved satisfaction on the part of the wives was improved genital hygiene, which is important in the kind of context that we're working. So this is the sort of background. I want to say a little bit about the operations research that's ongoing, um, trying to implement programs uh, of circumcision. We've been doing a lot of training of surgeons, theater assistants, counselors, etc. We're looking at different um, surgical procedures and we're comparing physicians to non-physicians. Because if we're going to implement this in Africa, we don't have enough doctors. We have to have clinical officers and nurses performing this surgery. Um, this shows uh, rates of complications and then the time required for surgery um, for two kinds of procedures and for physicians and non-physicians. We've shown that this dorsal slit surgery, which is simpler, has comparable low complication rates and takes a bit less time and that physicians and clinical officers are uh, both competent at performing this surgery with minimal complications. Um, we're about to start studies on new methods of circumcision. Uh, this is one developed in China called the Shang Ring, and this procedure takes five minutes for the surgery. The conventional procedures even in experienced hands, take 25 minutes or more. So this could reduce the theater time, which is really a constraint. Um, it's very straightforward. Uh, well, actually, I won't bore you with the details. We can come back if anyone's interested. <laughs> but essentially what it does, it traps the foreskin between this outer and inner ring, um, and it's removed seven to nine days after the surgery, and the man is circumcised. Uh, what is the potential impact then of circumcision on the HIV epidemic in Africa? 
we, we can model this um, using mathematical models. And this um, article uh, published last year sort of summarized the totality of uh, the modeling that had gone on. Circumcision is likely to have a direct effect on male acquisition of HIV. It'll be, it will reduce HIV infection in men by 50 to 60 percent. It may have n no direct benefit for women, partners, but it is likely to have an indirect benefit for women because if there are fewer men infected, there are fewer women exposed. And in places like South Africa or Botswana with very high rates of HIV, it only takes about 15 surgeries to avert one HIV infection over a 10 year period or so. So it's likely to be highly cost effective. And um, there have been efforts to look at cost effectiveness. Uh, the cost of surgery varies from about $30 to $60 in adults or adolescents and about $5 in infants. Um, the cost per infection averted, it will vary depending on the severity of the epidemic, but it's between $150 to $900 over 10 years, which in terms of cost effectiveness of HIV prevention is extremely good. You know, the mother to child transmission, it takes over $2,000 to avert one infant infection. Because you've got to screen so many women, you've got to treat so many women to avoid that one infection. So this, this is likely to be highly effective, um, or highly cost effective. And it's, uh, for each infection you avert, you uh, avoid also between seven to $8,000 cost of treating that infection. And it's been estimated that in Africa, um, you could avert about 4 million new infections. It's about 40% of the total infections projected in the future. So there are 13 uh, target countries in sub-Saharan Africa where circumcision could have an impact. These are countries where the rates of circumcision are low uh, and where HIV infections are high. This is a bit out of date, but this is the number of circumcisions performed in these countries. It's pitiful. And frankly, very disappointing. Here we are, we've been working for 30 years fighting this epidemic. We find something that we really think the evidence suggests will work and it's not being implemented. And the question is why? And this is a question I'd like to put to you because I think you know more about uh, policy and programs than I do. Um, the first point I want to make is we have never ever used surgery to prevent an infectious disease before. So this is a whole new paradigm. And it takes um, somewhat of an act of faith or imagination for policymakers to get their heads around that idea. But I think we have to ask ourselves, these trials, we, we have known since the beginning of 2007 that circumcision will prevent 50 to 60 percent of male infections. And yet the response has been almost zero. Um, it's not cultural opposition. We can't meet the demand. Um, there is not, at least in, in the cultures that we work in, a, a barrier either because of religion or other factors. Um, resource constraints, constraints of personnel and facilities 
are serious issues. Um, that could be overcome if there was political will and resources. But the most telling thing from my perspective is political leadership has been the major problem. In Uganda, President Museveni spoke out very uh, vociferously against circumcision. And it has not taken off in Uganda. In Kenya, in the, among the Luo politicians, in Kenya it was the Luo tribe that were uncircumcised. Senior Luo politicians went and got themselves circumcised, publicized it, and there has been very marked uptake of circumcision among the Luo in Kenya. And more recently in South Africa, uh, President Zuma has um, come out positively. So I guess part of the lesson I've learned from all of this is leadership from above is critical to getting these programs off the ground. And the lack of it has been a tragedy. So where do we go from here? We're scientists. Um, we're not very good at implementing programs on a national scale. There are many other organizations affiliated to Hopkins like JPIGO or the Center for Communication Programs that are much more effective in um, implementing national scale programs. The direction that we're headed in is the foreskin is a unique tissue. You know, it's really hard to study mucosa. Um, you know, if you want to study uh, any kind of mucosa, you've got to do biopsies. And people really are not very happy about having uh, biopsies of the vagina, rectum or what have you, uh, for no indication whatsoever. <laughs> so you can't get mucosa. But if we're going to understand how this virus crosses that mucosa and infects people, we have to get the tissue. The circumcision provides us with that tissue. It's leftover surgical, uh, post-surgical material. Um, so we have the world's largest collection of foreskins <laughs> and what we're hoping to do is to study those in the hope that we can develop a whole new uh, variety of vaccines. Instead of the vaccines that have been developed up to now, which try to develop um, immunity throughout the whole body, what we would hope to do, and it's a pious distant hope at this point, is to develop vaccines so that the antibody protection is at the level of the mucosa, where the rubber hits the road, where the virus penetrates the body. Um, we hope that this might help us develop new microbicides for women and provide us with insights that might control a variety of other um, gentle pathogens. So I'd like to end up by acknowledging the huge number of people who have contributed uh, to this work. Uh, this is a list of all our colleagues at Johns Hopkins. Um, you know, I want to, uh, oh, my wife is missing, my God. <laughs> Glad she's not here. Uh, my <laughs> wife, Maria Weaver, uh, partner in crime, should be in this list. Sorry about that. Um, but then there's a large number of our colleagues from Uganda, um, most of whom have actually trained at Hopkins, and David Sawada, who is the principal investigator in Uganda, I just learned um, is going to be given an honorary degree. Um, we are also collaborating with um, a variety of scientists around the world, and I want to acknowledge the funding from NIH and the Gates Foundation. So thank you very much.